take this. What am I supposed to do with it? I want you to go downrange over there, and I will deposit Professor Sprott gently and accurately into your outstretched net. Really? All right. Are you ready, downrange? You may fire when ready, Gridley. Fire! Oh! 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 Where is he? Oh, my! He's not here. He's gone. Oh, oh no! Where, where's Professor Sprott? Where's you? Good morning, you men of war. What you've done? No. Oh, no! Let's get oh. out of here. Oh! At least he's still kicking. See if we can't decant him. <sighs> Professor Sprott? Buck, 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 buck! Buck, buck, buck! Professor Sprott, are buck. you okay? Buck, 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 buck! Buck, 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 buck! Don't you know where you are? Buck, 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 buck! Oh, what a revolting development. Why buck. did I want to be the George Fenneman of physics? Buck, buck, buck! <sighs> Maybe buck. Narf can help. Oh, Narf! Steve Narf! Yeah, what can I help you with? I'm busy back here, too, you know. Yeah, well, I'm busy out here with a host who thinks he's a chicken. I suppose what? you like some toast with that, too. No, 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 no. Sprott thinks he's a chicken. He can't do the show this way. He's gonna lay an egg. Oh, just relax. Let me look something up on the web. Oh, relax, he says. What? 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 It doesn't have what? to what? spread what? straw. Oh, boy, here's some hits. What? What? Oh, yeah, here we go. Is it flapping his arms and clucking? Yeah. You know, they got a quick fix here. Why don't you hit him very hard with a vortex? A vortex? Hit a distinguished member of the physics faculty with, dare I say it, a vortex? Why, the idea is monstrous. Monstrous, I tell you. Well, they say it's lots of fun. Oh, well, in that case, that's what I like about the internet. No thinking, no judgment, just right answers. Yo, Henry had a hand. Hop right up there. That's it. Now you're going to get that engineering eye for the chicken guy. All right, I need your help. I need you to distract him while I do this. So cluck like other chickens. <laughs> um, Mr. Lovell, a moment ago I was in a very dark place and there was a loud noise and now I'm standing here looking like a chicken. Good grief, it actually worked. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the governor of the states of matter, shot from a gun, Professor Clint Sprout! Welcome to the wonders of physics. Now, I do want to talk to you today about the states of matter. The ancient Greeks thought there were four states of matter. They called them earth, uh, water, air, and fire. If you think about it, that includes a lot of things, but it doesn't quite include everything. So they almost had it right, but not quite. These days, we, talk, we call these things the four states of matter, solids, liquids, gases, and plasmas. And I want to start by showing you a demonstration that involves a liquid. I have a bucket here with a liquid in it. Do you know what this is? That's right, water. Do you think I can turn this bucket upside down over my head without getting wet? You do? That's not how you do it, is it? How do I do it? Oh, spin it around. Fast or slow? Fast. You're sure now. Slow? I don't know. Ooh! Well, that's right. If you spin it around fast enough, the water doesn't come out because of Newton's first law of motion. 
um, which says that an object in motion remains in motion uh, in the same way. Now, of course, one can do this with lots of different uh, liquids and also with, <laughs> with solids. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's an example of a liquid, and it's also an example of a solid. Now, there are many uh, solids that I could show you, and I want to show you a peculiar kind of solid right here. What does this look like to you? That's right, a chain. It's a little like a necklace. If it were a little bigger, I could put it over my head. But I don't want to do that. I want to put the necklace onto this wooden spool that's connected to a motor. And of course, at first it slips a bit. And, uh, but after a while, it will be going at the nice high speed of the spool. Now what I'm going to do is take a stick and I'm going to nudge it off the spool. And we'll see what happens. And you notice the chain stayed in a circular shape. And it's much for the same reason, Newton's third law, the law of um, inertia, just like the water in the bucket went around in a circle because there was something pulling it toward the center of the circle. In one case, it was my arm pulling it. In the other case, it was the, the tension in the adjacent links of chain that are pulling each link toward the center of the circle. That makes it go around in that way. So those are examples of solids in motion. And while we're talking about things that move, I want to ask you a question. I have two things in my hand. What is this? Ball of cotton and a ball. That's right. If I were to stand up on this stool and drop them side by side, who thinks the ball will hit the ground first? Who thinks the cotton will hit the ground first? Who thinks they will hit at exactly the same time? Well, that's good in science. It's OK to have theories about things. But we don't just argue, and we don't vote, but we do an experiment. So let's try it. And you notice the ball did hit the ground first, but maybe not for the reason that you thought. Not because the ball is heavier than the cotton, but because there's more air resistance with the cotton. And so the air slowed it down. And I can illustrate that with another apparatus right here. Can you see what's inside of here? Cotton and a penny. Anything else? Exactly, there's air in here. It's a long tube, but it's open to the air. And so I can repeat the experiment inside this tube. Now, maybe if you're in the back, it's hard for you to see the penny. But you can hear it if you listen very closely. And you see, indeed, the cotton falls much slower than the penny does, uh, much like the demonstration I did a moment ago. But the reason I'm doing this in a tube is so that I can take all of the air out of the tube. And to do that, we connect the tube back here to a vacuum pump. And then I'll turn on the vacuum pump. And you will see from the gauge here that the pressure is dropping. Uh, we're evacuating the tube. We're removing the air from the tube. And uh, if I remove all of the air, we have a perfect vacuum in here. But it's impossible to do that. Uh, there will always be a little bit of air left, uh, but not very much. You can see the gauge has come down very close to zero now. And when it gets down close to zero, we can close this valve. Once that valve is closed, we don't need the vacuum pump anymore. So we can turn off the vacuum pump. And in fact, we can disconnect the hose, which we no longer need. You see, indeed, air comes in. And we have a tube with what in it? Cotton? Penny? And no air. A little bit of air. In fact, we call that a vacuum. It's a partial vacuum. But now, if I start with a penny and the ball of cotton in one end and flip it over, they fall at the same rate. That's pretty amazing. Now, so you know there are no tricks, I can let the air back in. You see the air going in. And I can do it one last time. And you see now, the ball of cotton falls very slowly. And so it is a fact that objects near the surface of the Earth, as we all are, fall with the same acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared, independent of what they're made out of, independent of how heavy they are, um, and everything else, as long as we can uh, neglect the air resistance that slows it down. Now, speaking of gases, and air, of course, is a gas, I have in here another substance that, uh, in fact, will make a gas. Do you know what, what is in here? 
Actually, uh, there's a liquid in here. It's liquid carbon dioxide. Now, normally, carbon dioxide is a gas, right? When you're breathing air, you're breathing a tiny bit of carbon dioxide right now. And so there's carbon dioxide all around us, and it's normally a gas. But if you put carbon dioxide under enough pressure, it becomes a liquid. And that's what we've done here. So this has liquid carbon dioxide. But when I press on the nozzle here, uh, it releases the pressure, and some of the carbon dioxide liquid actually boils, and it comes out as a gas. And I want to show you that, but I want to do it from the top of a rotating platform. And you notice it makes me go around. You also notice that once I start going around, it's hard to stop. How do I stop? The other way? Well, that's right. And of course, that's the principle of the rocket. And the rocket, of course, is very important because it's the way we uh, have to go from one place to another throughout the solar system. And I want to show you another example of a rocket here that you're all actually quite familiar with. Do any of you have something like this at home? That's right. It's a lawn sprinkler. And you know, if you connect it to the water and get out of the way, it spins around, right? But you don't see any water coming out. And that's because it's not connected to water right now, but it's connected to compressed air. And so indeed, something's coming out, but uh, it's only air. And so you don't see it. And indeed, a rocket will work. Uh, whether you shoot a liquid out the back um, or whether you shoot a, a gas out the back, as we did here and as we did over there. So um, rockets, uh, of course, can be made very large, and uh, I hope these demonstrate the basic principles on which oh, the ro Professor rocket works. Sprott. That was so weak, so puny, such baby stuff. These good people didn't come here to see a lawn sprinkler. <laughs> they came here to see a rocket. And I suppose you have such a thing? I try not to let my mouth write checks that my brain can't cash. I always worry when Mr. Lovell gets that gleam in his eye. Well, this is no rocket. This looks like a tiny railroad track for a very small train. That's a jug of water. I know that. Empty, no less. Elementary, my dear Sprott. It's not empty, however. You notice? Oh, almost empty. It's just a little bit of alcohol. That can't do anything. We'll see. <laughs> I need your help. It's impossible to launch a rocket without a countdown. So let's start from five. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. We have left off. Well, that's pretty amazing. And of, and of course, with very large rockets, we can go to places like the moon and even to Mars. Hey, you there, rocket boy. I got a frongo to go with you. Well, who are you? I'm Martina Marchanel. And I am tired of this callous earth centrist behavior. We have to share a solar system, you know. Martinella? Solar system? You're not from Mars. Oh, got it in one, you planetary polluter, you. But you know, we reject the name Mars. Who would give naming rights to a people who are content to be from a place they call dirt? Not dirt, Earth. And if you don't call your planet Mars, what do you call it? Neil Walkie. <laughs> but I didn't come here to discuss geography. When I heard you so callously explaining rockets to these innocent children, I knew I was in the right place. You know, physics, it's such a wonderful thing. It's the same wonder throughout the universe, and you're so crass. 
Yes, well, except for here on Earth, we have gravity that is different from the gravity on Mars, I mean Milwaukee. Yes. Well, it's about 1580 That's about a third yours. You know, we've thought about putting weight loss ads on your internet, and then we tell everybody to come to Milwaukee, and they'd lose two-thirds of their weight. Oh, I don't think that would work. They would lose their weight, but they would have the same mass, and then when they came back to dirt, I mean Earth, they would weigh the same. <coughs> oh, well, you know, we Milwaukeeans have a saying. There's a Tsnonongo born every Fenongo. <laughs> but we're not here to complain about physics. I'm here to complain about your miserable rockets. How would you like it if every so often people were dropping drunk on your heads? And now you have this contraption, and it's got this flipped out computer. Hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye. And it's got this little buddy, and the two of them go around the planet, and they're scraping rocks, and they're taking pictures like crazy tourists. But we're just trying to see if there's life on Mars. Well, there is. Now will you cut it out? Well, okay, but maybe you can help us demonstrate gravity, Mars gravity for us. Well, how can I do that on this ever so heavy, hot, thick air planet? Well, if you just walk right over to our Mars gravity simulator. Step up on this platform. And I see you're wearing a peculiar kind of belt. Of what oh. use is that to a Marsh, I mean a Milwaukeean? Well, you know, it keeps me safe during these extreme maneuvers in my saucer. Like when I'm avoiding your goofy rockets. Hmm. Well, that may be, but it's just exactly what we need to attach you to this rope oh. in the ceiling. Now, if you'll just step up on the platform, you'll feel the gravity that you're used to on Mars, a Milwaukee. Oh, oh. oh this is Fenogamogel. This feels just like home. Oh, can you make one of these for every planet and moon? Can I take one back to show the people of Milwaukee what Earth's gravity is like? You and I can go into interplanetary business. Well, no, actually that wouldn't work. We can demonstrate gravity that's less than Earth gravity this way. Ooh. But I suppose we could do that if we gave you like a 300-pound backpack to wear on Mars, oh. on, on Milwaukee. Well, that's too bad. You know, I'm sorry I went off the pranocle before. This is fun. But, you know, I think it's time to get back to my software. I'm going to ask you one favor, though. Okay, what's that? Well, you know, the next time you come, could you knock first? Well, I suppose we can do that, It'd yes. It would be very nice if you didn't just barge in. Okay, oh, okay. Okay, bye-bye. Bye! -bye. bye. <laughs> well, I don't think we've ever had a Martian here before. But, you know, we do have spacecraft on Mars, and it's looking for evidence of life. It's also looking for things like water, which would be an important ingredient for life. And you may wonder whether Mars could have water. And I have a demonstration back here that will actually help you understand that. Here I have a little uh, flask that has in it some water. And if it's hard for you to see here, uh, you can perhaps look at it on the television monitor there. Now, Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere. The atmosphere of Mars is only about, is less than 1% of the atmosphere on the Earth, and it's mostly carbon dioxide. And so to simulate the Mars atmosphere, we have to evacuate this. So we'll connect it to our vacuum pump back here and turn on the vacuum pump, and you'll get to see what will happen to liquid water if it were under the uh, conditions of the Mars atmosphere. And you see it's boiling. And in fact, you're uh, perhaps familiar with that. Uh, when you reduce the pressure, water boils at a lower temperature. If you live in a city like Denver, people are very aware of that. It's much harder to cook food because it doesn't get so hot. Now, if you look at it right now, uh, you notice that, in fact, ice is formed. And, in fact, when I touch it, it feels quite cold, just like you would expect if it were filled with ice water. And that's quite remarkable when you think about it. We have taken liquid water, and we have made it boil, and then we have made it freeze without any source of heat or refrigeration. And that's one reason it's unlikely there's very much, if, it, if any, liquid water on Mars, because it would either boil away because of the low pressure, or it would freeze because it's very cold there. And so, if there's water, it would probably 
be in the form of ice. Now, I want to show you another similar demonstration. And this takes uh, a moment for it to uh, warm up. But I have here another flask that has water in it. And I'm going to this time heat it with a burner underneath. Now, as you would expect, uh, in time, the water will begin to boil. Now, it takes a little while, so I'm just going to let it boil. And then I'll show you something else over here. And then we'll come back to it in a moment. So um, does anyone here have a birthday today? Oh, way back there. What is your name? Janet. Janet? Yeah. OK, Janet. Uh, I'm going to light some candles in honor of Janet's birthday. Now, I only have five candles. You're probably a little older than that. I can't quite tell the glare of the lights. We're going to light five candles for Janet. Fourth, five candles in honor of Janet's birthday. Now, you may ask, well, why did I light those candles? Well, because I want to show you something that is really pretty unusual. I have back here a beaker. And um, what is in this beaker? Air. Air? You're sure? Water? Looks pretty empty, doesn't it? But let's see, try something. What if I pour it down here? Well, that's pretty remarkable. It looked like I was pouring a beaker that had air in it. But in fact, it didn't. This had carbon dioxide gas in it. Now, carbon dioxide is a gas that's about 50% heavier than air. So I could walk around with a beaker full of carbon dioxide, and it wouldn't go away. It doesn't rise and, and mix with the air that's surrounding it. Now, you may wonder how I got a beaker filled with carbon dioxide gas. And I did that starting with a solid. Do you know what the solid is called? That's right. It's called dry ice. You ever wondered why they call it dry ice? Why? That's right. It doesn't make things wet. In fact, uh, dry ice changes directly from a solid into a gas without ever melting. You know what that process is called? That's right. It's called sublimation. But it looks a little bit like a marshmallow, doesn't it? Here's a marshmallow. You can put it right next to it, and they look pretty similar. But one is very cold. Dry ice is at a temperature of about 109 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, or about 78 degrees below zero Celsius. It's really cold stuff. Uh, but it, um, it does undergo this process of sublimation. Does water ice sublimate? Well, in fact, it does. Have you ever noticed that when it snows, uh, even when it, the temperature doesn't warm up above freezing, little by little, the snow evaporates? Or have you noticed that when you put some ice cubes in your freezer and then you don't use them for a few weeks and you come back, they're gone? There's no puddle of water there. So water ice also will change into a gas under the right conditions and not melt. And so um, these are uh, properties of, uh, obviously, solids, liquids, and gases. Now, we're still not boiling over here, so we'll give this a, a just, just a bit longer. And I'll call your attention to some balloons that are over here. What do you think are, is in these balloons right here? Helium. Now, why do you think it's helium? That's right, because it floats. It's, uh, helium is a gas that's less dense than air. And uh, so one can lift a certain weight with it, but not a very big weight. Uh, in fact, if I would put any significant weight on here at all, it would simply go to the floor quite rapidly. And so helium uh, in a balloon is pushed upward, and it's pushed upward by a force that is exactly equal to the weight of the air that was where the balloons are now. That air has been pushed aside in order to make space for the balloons, and it pushes up on the balloons. And so uh, helium, of course, uh, can lift things, but not very much. What do you think are in those balloons way up in the ceiling? Helium? Hydrogen? Well, those are all good guesses, because those are gases that are less dense than air. But this is a pretty remarkable case, because I can now put weights on here. The weight that brought that balloon down? Um, this is evidently a very special kind of gas, right? I can put on even another, and it still doesn't come down. Do you know what's in those balloons? It, no, it's exactly the same helium as in this, these balloons, except the string is attached to a hook in the ceiling. <laughs> so it turns out that different gases are, have different efficiencies when they lift, but you can't do very much better than helium. Hydrogen is a tiny bit better. It has a little bit more buoyancy than, uh, than helium, 
but um, very little. And so uh, there is no magic gas that will uh, lift uh, very much more effectively than helium itself does. So that's a little bit of a trick, but it, it's a reason to caution you. When you do experiments in science, you do have to be very careful that you understand the conditions under which the experiment is being done. And when you have a hook in the ceiling, all bets are off, right? So let's see, our water's boiling over here. And as the water begins to boil, you see something coming out the top here. What is this? It's steam? It's water vapor? It's gas? Well, in fact, a gas is coming off, and steam is coming out of that nozzle. But you know, steam is actually an invisible gas. You can't see steam. There's steam inside of here, and it's perfectly uh, clear and colorless, and you don't see it. What you're actually seeing up here is when the steam comes in contact with the air, the air is much uh, cooler than the steam, as you would expect. So uh, the steam is cooled down, and it changes back into a liquid. So it changes from a gas, steam, back into liquid water, but not this kind of water, little tiny, tiny droplets of water. And that's what makes up a cloud, in fact, tiny droplets of liquid water. So that's what you're seeing. You're seeing uh, the water vapor that was in the air being condensed into tiny droplets of liquid water. And also the, the water in the steam is uh, changing back into uh, liquid water. So it's been boiling quite a while. And um, at this point, I want to turn off the, uh, the heat underneath and let the boiling stop. Um, of course, when the heat goes off, uh, it will eventually stop boiling. And uh, once it stops, what is going to be inside this flask? Water. Uh, but what? there's two kinds of water. There's uh, liquid water, but there's also gaseous water, namely steam. And so once we get some steam in there, uh, what I want to do is close this little valve on the top. And then we will have a container that has liquid water and has gaseous water in it, and not much of anything else. There may still be a little bit of air in there, but not too much. So let me close this. And once this is closed, I'm then going to take some ice, a little uh, jug here. I want to pour the water out because some of it's melted, and put some ice around it. And you'll see a very interesting thing. Do you see the water beginning to boil? Let me get the burner out from beneath it. Uh, the water, in fact, is boiling uh, when we put the ice on it. That's pretty remarkable. Normally, you think you have to heat something to make it boil. But here, we made something boil by cooling it with the ice. And so, uh, a lot of the things you think you understand, perhaps, about liquids and gases and solids are, in fact, not quite right. And the reason it's boiling is the same reason it boiled back here. Because once we cool down the steam, it condenses back into liquid water. And that leaves a partial vacuum in the flask, because there's a partial vacuum that reduces the pressure, much as it did over here. And once you reduce the pressure, water will boil at a lower temperature. And here the water is boiling at a much lower temperature than it was before when we were heating it from below. And to show you that, in fact, that's what's happening, I can open this to the air, and air goes in, and that causes the boiling to stop. And so uh, this is simply another explanation of the same thing. We have over here succeeded in boiling something and freezing it without any source of heat or refrigeration. And here we actually boiled something using something cold, namely ice. So it is not true that you need to heat something to make it boil. There are other ways to make things boil. Now, uh, speaking of, um, of air and, and gases, uh, I talked about these balloons and the fact that they are lifted by a force that is equal to the weight of the air that would have been there if the balloons weren't there. Now, you don't normally think of air as having any weight, do you? And it doesn't have very much, but it does have a little bit. And I can illustrate that with an apparatus right here. And you might want to see this on the, on the video monitor. There's a balance scale, and there are two objects. One is a little cylinder of brass, and the other is a brass sphere that's hollow, and in fact, it contains air on the inside. And they're inside this jar, which right now has air in it. And they are carefully in balance because they weigh exactly the same. Now, if I remove all the air from the outside, then um, the upward force will be different on the two because the, the sphere 
is uh, moving aside more air than the little cylinder is. And so you might expect then uh, the sphere, uh, which is now being held up by the weight of the air that's surrounding it, uh, that upward force will go away, and you might see the balance, in fact, change. So let's see if we can uh, turn on the pump. And we are slowly removing the air from in here. And you'll be able to watch up there and see if the balance scale is moving at all. Can you see it moving? Yes? Well, that's right. As we remove the air, the uh, one on the left is becoming heavier. Or actually, it's not becoming heavier, but it's not pushed up as much as it was before. So the one on the left, that brass sphere, is behaving a little bit like a helium-filled balloon, isn't it? That as long as there's air surrounding it, uh, it is pushed up. But as soon as we remove the surrounding air, it's not pushed up. Now, so you know there's no trick. I can turn off the vacuum pump, and then I can let air in. I guess the easiest way is just to disconnect it here. And you will see it, I hope, come back into balance. So that illustrates that, in fact, air has weight. It's not very much. Now, on my entrance, um, you notice Mr. Lovell uh, used a vortex gun to, uh, to do something to me. And you've probably not seen one of these. But it's a gun that shoots a gas. Now, you normally think of a gun as shooting a bullet or something. But this one shoots a vortex of air. And it's got a, a little diaphragm back here. And it's got some rubber bands. So it's a little like a slingshot. So if I go like this, I can shoot people with air. And that's what we call a vortex. And there are many ways to make a vortex. And I have one over here, an apparatus that will make a vortex that, in fact, will be, uh, you'll be able to see it. I have here a plywood box. Uh, it's hollow on the inside. And on one side is plywood. And you see there's a hole here. And on the other side is a rubber membrane. And then there's a little uh, uh, wood uh, disc here that I can move in and out. Now, you may wonder why I do all that, because we are able to make a vortex come out this hole. But of course, if I just did it like this, you wouldn't be able to see it any better than you could over there. So we need to make some smoke. Now, there are various ways to do that. And I'm going to use a chemical called titanium tetrachloride, whose um, only useful property, as far as we are concerned, is to make smoke. Okay? So I'm going to put this around the rim of the hole. Just put it on there. And then just for good measure, I'm going to put the copper swa cotton swab inside and seal off the bottle so it's not making so much smoke. And then I'm just going to tap it on the back. That's right. They're smoke rings, or as we prefer to call them, they're vortices. And uh, vortices are around us all the time, but you don't normally notice them because usually they're invisible. But in fact, uh, you can have a vortex coming off the wingtips of a large airplane. And in fact, pilots have to be very aware of wingtip vortices, because if you fly too close behind a big airplane, it can upset uh, the plane you're flying in. And so uh, pilots have to be able to visualize those vortices that come off the wingtips of airplanes. Now, um, while we're talking about gases, I wanted to show you another demonstration that involves uh, two special gases. But I noticed they haven't been delivered yet. Mr. Lovell, where are those gases I ordered? Yes, you like gases. Oh, you must be the gas lady. Gas lady. I'm not a gas lady. I'm not some room-filling vapor. Well, all right. I meant you must be the lady with gas. OK, now he's just rude. I haven't been to Taco Bell all week, I'll have you know. <laughs> Well, OK, you must be the nice lady that delivers the gas that we use in the Wonders of Physics lectures. Much better. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I am. I have brought two gases, sulfur hexafluoride and helium. I see. And you're going to make me guess which is which, aren't you? Of course. Well, maybe the audience could help. One is helium, and one is sulfur hexafluoride. Is this the helium? No. Is this the helium? Yeah. Is that your final answer? Well, that's right, because helium is a gas that's less dense than air. Sulfur hexafluoride is a very heavy gas. And it's hard to believe that's even a gas that's so heavy. But I wanted you to bring these in, because I wanted to show what would happen if we would breathe them. Can you help me? Breathe them? Why would you want to do that? Well, we'll breathe it, and you'll see why. OK.
So what's it supposed to do? Oh, cool. Oh, it makes you talk kind of like a chicken, but I sound pretty normal. You do not. Well, that's true. I, I sound a little like Elmer Fudd, I guess. But, but you know, um, um, you sound almost normal again now. Of course. I'm more normal to begin with. Well, that's true, but I still sound kind of funny. And I think I know the reason for that, because the helium is a light gas, and it goes out your nose and goes away, whereas the heavy gas stays down in my lungs for a long time. How are you going to get it out? Well, you could uh, hang me upside down by my feet. Um, I don't think I could do that very well. Well, maybe if you hold this, I can just bend over and exhale. <laughs> and now I hope I sound normal again, do I? Close Not quite. Enough. Oh, close enough. <laughs> well, thank you for bringing those gases. That was a nice demonstration. Thank you for teaching me all about gases. Now, I want to caution you. Most gases you breathe are harmful. In fact, even some of the air we breathe is not very good for us, but we don't have much choice. Don't go out and breathe gases. Helium and sulfur hexafluoride are two of, the, uh, uh, of a very small number of gases that it is safe to breathe. And even the helium that you get, like at the circus or at the fair, is not safe to breathe because it's not sufficiently pure. When we do this, we use very high-grade and very expensive um, research-grade helium and sulfur hexafluoride. And uh, when the gases are absolutely pure, then these things are safe. But uh, you cannot always guarantee that uh, they are pure. And so uh, this is one of those demonstrations that uh, we can safely do here, but we don't want to encourage you to do these things at home. Now, I want to show you a few things that involve electricity. And uh, for the first thing I want to show you, I'm going to use the fur of a cat donated to us after the cat no longer needed it. And I'm going to take this, and I'm going to rub it on a piece of plastic here. And you've probably all uh, had the experience of petting a cat and then walking across the room and touching the doorknob and getting a spark. You done that? That's right. It's static electricity. And that's sort of what we're going to do here, except I'm going to do it in a little bit different way. I'm going to take a metal plate. It's actually hollow, but it's made out of metal. And I'm going to lower this down over this piece of plastic. And then I'm going to connect a little bit of aluminum foil to it to discharge it. And then I'm simply going to pick it up and touch it. And it makes a spark. And I can keep doing that. And each time I do it, I get a spark. Would someone like to try it? Are you a lawyer? OK. <laughs> And that demonstration is called electrophorus. And of course, it's one way to make electricity. It's static electricity. But you know the electricity you have in your homes is not static electricity. It's uh, electricity is made in a more powerful way. Uh, you get it out of the wall socket at home. And uh, we have that kind of electricity back here. And I'm going to charge up what we call a capacitor. It's a device that, charge, that stores electrical energy. And I'm charging it up. And you can see from the meter here that I'm charging it to about 2,000 volts, now 3,000 volts. When it gets up to about 6,000 volts, I'm going to discharge it into this uh, strip of aluminum foil. Now, you notice Mr. Lovell with his fingers in his ears? If loud noises bother you, you may want to put your fingers in your ears. Is everyone ready? Here we go. And you notice the aluminum foil is completely gone. In fact, the aluminum foil, just like the aluminum foil in your kitchen, started as a solid, and we heated it up so much with that electric current that it, in fact, turned into a gas. And uh, the gas uh, went over, and it touched things. And one of the things it touched was this uh, plastic shield here. And you can see, when it touched the plastic shield, it converted back into a solid. And it actually plated some of the aluminum foil on the back of that piece of plastic. That's uh, just there for protection. And so um, that's an example of how powerful electricity can be, converting, in that case, a solid into a gas and then back to a solid again as it uh, cooled down. So um, there are many things we can do with electricity. That was 5,000 volts. Would you like to see what a million volts would do? OK, for this, I need a very brave volunteer. OK, how about you? Come over here. 
Come right over here and tell us your name. Aiden. Eden? Aiden. Aiden. Okay, Aiden. Uh, turn around and face the audience here for a moment. Do you have electricity at your house? What do you use it for? TV, lights, anything else? How about a hair dryer? You have one of those? You do, huh? Yeah, electricity is pretty useful. Did the electricity ever go off at your house? Yeah. It did, huh? You kind of missed it, didn't you? A lot of things you couldn't do, right? So you're feeling brave, are you? Okay, <laughs> what we'd like you to do is turn to your right and walk right over to this cage. have a seat in what looks very much like an electric chair. Over on Aiden's right is a million volt Tesla coil. As long as you don't stick your fingers through the cage, you shouldn't feel a thing. Makes a little bit of noise though, but remember, you're brave. Thank you, Aiden. Now, there are a lot of interesting things we can do with a million volt Tesla coil. And the next thing is a little too dangerous to ask for a volunteer. So we're going to use Steve Narf, who's one of our trusted assistants, <laughs> to actually set up uh, most of these demonstrations for us. And uh, Steve, as you know, notice, has put a headband on that is wetted down. And then he's putting a crown on his head. And on that crown are some little sharp needles that point up. And believe it or not, those are lightning rods. Because if any sparks were to come off his body, we don't want to set his hair on fire. Now, you notice Steve has taken his shoes and socks off, and he's standing on a tray of water that is connected with a copper tube to the terminal of the million-volt Tesla coil. You also notice that Steve is putting thimbles on his fingers, because if any sparks were to come off the tips of his fingers, it could burn him seriously. And so by putting those metal thimbles on, the sparks will come off the little points on the end of the thimbles, and uh, we'll keep from injuring him. So you will now see <laughs> why we call Steve Narf the human conductor. Steve has taken the thimbles off his fingers, and so to protect his hands, we're going to give him in one hand an ordinary, well, not so ordinary, 2,000 watt light bulb. <laughs> and in the other hand, we're going to give him a uh, fluorescent light, much like the fluorescent light bulbs that you have at home and that are in the light fixtures overhead. And just for good measure, we'll give people in, a couple of people in the audience a couple of these fluorescent lights. Um, And if you'll just hold those up nice and uh, high, we will once again show you Steve Narf, the human conductor. Well, that's uh, pretty spectacular, I have to confess. Now, we've talked about three of the states of matter. We've talked a lot about solids, liquids, and gases. But there's a fourth state of matter that you don't hear much about, and it's called plasma. And this has nothing to do with blood. Uh, this is a kind of a plasma that occurs when you heat a gas sufficiently. And it turns out the sparks coming off the terminal of that Tesla coil is, in fact, a plasma. If you take any substance and cool it sufficiently, uh, it becomes a solid, like water becomes ice. Then if you begin to heat the solid, typically most solids will melt. Not all. Dry ice uh, evaporates without melting. But most things change into a liquid. If you heat a liquid, it will usually change into a gas. That's what happens when it boils. If you continue heating a gas, it in fact will turn into a plasma. And a plasma is much like an ordinary gas, except it's a conductor of electricity. And uh, that makes all of the difference in the world. And I can show you several examples of a plasma. 
And I've got back here a tube uh, that right now has air in it. And so in order to make a plasma, one of the first things we need to do is to lower the pressure. So I'm going to turn the vacuum pump on and lower the pressure inside this tube. Now to make a plasma, we need to heat it somehow. We need a source of energy. And I'm going to use electric energy. Uh, that's one of the most efficient kinds of energy we know. And so I'm going to put about 500 volts between these electrodes at the two ends of the tube. And when I do that, I hope that we will be able to make a plasma for you. Now this may take a moment because it is only, there we go, as the pressure drops, we reach a point where the, uh, the gas becomes electrically conducting. And now I'm going to take a very powerful magnet and bring it up close to the plasma and show you that, in fact, we can affect the plasma with a magnetic field. So you may wonder how you control a plasma. Well, this is one way. You control it with a very powerful magnetic field. And so we can turn this off and turn off the vacuum pump. And um, that is one example of a plasma. Now, I have here another gadget that makes a plasma. And you may have seen these, maybe not one quite as large as this. But this is what we call a plasma globe. And it also has a very low pressure gas inside. And it has some electric voltage that makes these uh, electric discharges. And so this is an electrically conducting gas. And you've probably played with those before. Here's another example of the same thing. Inside of here is an electrically conducting gas, a plasma, that is actually emitting some ultraviolet radiation that is making um, a phosphor on the inside of the glass glow when it is exposed to that uh, um, ultraviolet light. So these are two examples of plasmas. And uh, plasmas are actually uh, very common throughout the universe. In fact, it's been estimated that upwards of 99% of the universe is a plasma. The Earth is an unusual place where matter exists in those other three states. All of the stars are big balls of plasma. On the Earth, we have plasmas in lightning bolts and uh, in fluorescent lights. And the ionosphere of the Earth is a plasma. And uh, there are also some technological applications of plasmas. Maybe some of you have seen these plasma TVs that they're selling. Uh, they're little tiny. Game on. Hey, everybody. Hey, Dr. Spratt. Well, Mike, what brings you here today? Well, I'm ready for the big game. I heard you say plasma TV, so you must be watching a game on TV or something. Well, no, actually, this is the only game in town, but what is all this? Well, uh, of course, I'm a mega sports fan, as you probably know. I've got my Pentium 4 remote control, got my beverage, chips, superconducting beverage cooler. I'm all ready to go. And I heard you had a six pixel TV, like six megapixels. Well, no, we don't have any TV here, but I do have something that has six uh, uh, little plasma elements, and I suppose they're a little bit like a TV. Six they're little pixels? tiny neon bulbs, one through six. Six pixels? Yeah, six pixels. Oh, dear. I don't know how good a picture you would get on this, but I can plug it in. and. Uh, how am can... I going to watch a halftime show on six pixels? Oh, I don't think you ought to be watching halftime shows. Oh, no. But you see, they're lighting, and they're blinking, in fact, in a chaotic manner. And this is a little like the pixels in the plasma television that some of you may have seen. And um, of course, as they blink, that's how you get the illusion of motion and how you can display a motion picture. And in the plasma TV, the little pixels that are illuminated are making ultraviolet light that, in fact, is illuminating uh, phosphors of different colors, like red, green, and blue, so you can see in color. Hmm. Well, thanks for explaining that. I guess I'll have to go find another TV somewhere to watch the big game. Well, I'm sorry about that, but thanks for stopping in. Thank you. So long. Well, that's right. On a plasma television, it uh, has typically like a million of those little tiny pixels, uh, very small, and they're all uh, made out of plasmas. But as I showed you before, uh, we use magnetic fields to control plasmas. And I want to show you an example of something that involves a magnet. Here I have a very powerful magnet. And I can illustrate that by taking something that's made out of iron or steel. And you see it's attracted to the magnet by quite a large force. So this is a magnet. And uh, you know that magnets attract some things, but not other things. And one of the things a magnet doesn't normally attract is copper. Copper is not a magnetic material. And here I have a plate of copper. And if I bring the magnet near it, 
you notice a peculiar thing. It falls rather slowly, doesn't it? In fact, I can put it up on its end and I can tip it over. And you see it falls only very slowly. And that's because when you bring a magnet near a good electrical conductor, it induces an electric current in the conductor, and that makes the conductor momentarily magnetic. And the better electrical conductor it is, the stronger is the effect. And it turns out there is a way to make copper better electrically conducting, and that is to cool it down. And to cool it, we use liquid nitrogen. And nitrogen is very cold stuff. I can pour a little bit out here. It pours a little like water. And of course, nitrogen is normally a gas, but um, it's a gas that boils at a very low temperature, minus 321 degrees Fahrenheit. And so it's very cold. And I have here some liquid nitrogen, and that's cooling this piece of copper right here. And now when I drop the magnet onto the copper, you see how very slowly it responds, because those currents, they're called eddy currents, die away only very slowly. So let's try it again. Oops. And I can uh, tip it over. So that's pretty remarkable. And it's even hard to pick up for the same reason. If I pick it up slowly, it's easy. But if I try to pick it up fast, it's like it's stuck to the copper because it induces an electric current in the copper. And to show you that's really uh, because it's a magnet, here I have another disk that in fact is not magnetic at all. It's not at all attracted to a, um, a piece of uh, steel. And when I drop that, it just drops as you would expect, nothing very special. Well, I talked earlier about a phosphor. A phosphor is a material that glows when it's bombarded by ultraviolet or, or electrons or, uh, or uh, even visible light. And I want to show you another example that involves a phosphor. And for this, I need a volunteer. Who will help? OK, come down here. Turn around. What's your name? Lee. Lee? OK, Lee, you have any phosphors at your house? You don't know? You have a television? I'll bet you have a phosphor. Because on the inside surface of your television screen, there's a phosphor. And the reason the screen lights up is that there's a beam of electrons that hits that phosphor. And when the electrons hit the phosphor, it makes it glow. And that's how it works. So you've got a phosphor at home, I'll bet. I'll bet. And uh, we want to let you demonstrate uh, how phosphors work. You're feeling brave? OK. If you'll just walk over to my assistant, Mr. Lovell. We have here behind this door a panel that is made out of a phosphorescent material. And so what we're going to ask you to do, we're going to open the door here. We're going to ask you to step right up uh, close to the screen there. Mr. Lovell is going to take what amounts to a flash bulb, like in a camera, and we're going to try to take a picture. What was your name? Lee. Oh, Lee. Right. OK, Lee, just stand there. Now, back away. Can you see your image there? See your shadow? Let's try it again. Shake hands with yourself this time. <laughs> OK, now back away. So there you are, shaking hands with yourself. Thank you, Lee. And so, and so this is a phosphorescent screen. Now, the phosphor in your television, when you remove the electron beam, it goes out right away. And, mo and a lot of phosphors do that. But some phosphors uh, continue to glow after you remove whatever it is that caused them to glow. And so in this case, Mr. Lovell illuminated the phosphor with a flash bulb, like on a camera. And uh, where Lee was, it made a shadow. And so you saw parts of the phosphor were not illuminated, and so they were not glowing. So um, these are some of the things that involve uh, the physics of light. Now, I want to show you something else that's uh, pretty neat that involves uh, a liquid. I have back here a liquid. Do you recognize this? That's right. It's ordinary water. And in front of this is a candle. And I'm going to light the candle. And as you know, in order for something to burn, uh, it cannot be underwater, right? But if you look carefully with the lights uh, down, you will see that it looks like the candle is, in fact, burning under the water. Can you see that? And you may wonder why that is. 
how we can do that. Well, the light from the candle is hitting a plate of glass right here, and uh, you are seeing a reflection of the candle in the front surface of this glass. But uh, you can also see through the glass, and so behind the glass is this beaker of water. So you're seeing light coming from two different places at the same time. You're seeing the light coming from the candle, but you're also seeing the light coming from the uh, beaker of water behind it, and it looks like the candle is burning underneath the water. So that brings us to the very last demonstration, and I always like to conclude these shows with one final demonstration that in fact involves a gas and a liquid. And so uh, for this I'm going to put on my hat, and I'm going to bring out a container that has in it liquid nitrogen. It's the same liquid nitrogen I used before, and uh, what we're going to do is pump uh, nitrogen gas into this container, that will force the liquid nitrogen up into this uh, copper pipe where it will come out a bunch of holes on the top and it will come in contact with the air. When it does, it will cool the air and the moisture in the air will condense into very tiny droplets of liquid water. And in fact, that's what we call a cloud. And with that, I thank you all for coming.